Hi, I'm Vicky Hill. I'm Project Associate for Changing Mindsets and Associate Lecturer for Thinking Teaching at University of the Arts London and I'm really pleased to welcome Dr Gurnam Singh, Principal Lecturer in Social Work at Coventry University and Visiting Fellow in Race and Education here at UAL. So welcome Gurnam. Hi, thanks Vicky. Well, hi. Hi. So we've been we've been talking about um, about critical pedagogy, and you've been explaining your your own research. Um, and my final question here is is to ask you what does critical ped pedagogy actually look like in practice? What does it feel like? Yeah. What would it be like to to be experiencing yeah. that within the HE context? Okay. Well, I mean, I think one of the things is just to explain the word pedagogy because that can be quite de deceptive. And um, traditionally, pedagogy is interpreted as teaching children, you know, ped, ped out as child, child learning. But actually, critical pedagogy is really about um, teaching, the, teaching the human being. It has a more expansive kind of notion of the human being. And, and, you know, the starting point is to see the learner as not just a thinking being, but as a feeling and doing being, mm. uh, and not, not, not elevating one higher than the other. So, you know, it's, it's kind of connecting, if you like, effective, affective, and um, uh, cognitive kind of dimensions of learning. Mm -hmm. um, but another important thing is that, that the, the, the pedagogical enterprise has got to, uh, it's got to advance, as it were, or expand people's uh, humanity, if you like, uh, and that can be touched in so many ways, but certainly it shouldn't be dehumanizing. It shouldn't be reducing the person's potential and capacity to flourish in the kind of Aristotelian sense, yeah? Mm -hmm. So the, the, these are all kind of, um, you know, some of the kind of underlying kind of drivers, principles on which you can then design whatever learning, you know, I don't think that there's a, it says that, you know, you have to kind of sing and dance and participate. I think some people misinterpret critical pedagogy as this is all about kind of sitting around in a circle with a campfire and it can be those things, you know, that that's, it's lovely to do that, but it could well be a really stimulating lecture as well that really gets the person thinking because the other aspect is is it says that one of the ways in which you can advance uh this kind of humanizing is is to enable dialogue to take place and of course dialogue can happen in so many different ways mm -hmm. dialogue can happen between two people as we're doing now so in some sense this is a, a vehicle that, through which we can engage in critical pedagogy but dialogue can happen with an audience dialogue can happen uh with with students in the audience and the teacher and the dialogue can happen with self as well. So you can, you know, have a dialogue with your own self. Uh, and But dialogue is important. Um, but let me just kind of illustrate how we might be able to say teach something that might might be taught in a neuroscience class or in a psychology class. And uh, what would be the difference between, say, critical education and critical pedagogy? Uh, let's look at, say, the question of, say, human intelligence. You know, consider we're looking at the research that, you know, apparently demonstrates, purportedly demonstrates that African-Americans are less intelligent than other ethnic groups based on, say, low IQ technical scores. Now, within the critical thinking tradition, concerns about whether such conclusions are justified would be addressed through methodological questions, the reliability of the instruments by which intelligence is tested, the validity maybe of the findings, and the clarity of key terms such as the concept of intelligence. So, and that's good, you know, that, that's what we do teach in universities that we should do, you know, for students to be critical thinkers. But from a critical pedagogy perspective, whilst those questions are important and shouldn't be ignored, the underlying problems, not just about methodology and evidence, yeah? They would be concerned with questions about the context in which IQ testing itself mm. is seen to be important, relevant the role of particular modes of inquiry in relation to power relations. In this instance, the role of intelligence testing, what was it used for uh, within the context of maybe racist practice and ideology and also societal kind of ideas about racial kind of, you know, kind of abilities, race, race itself. Mm -hmm. So hence for critical pedagogy questions such as who is making the assertions about the relationship between intelligence and race or gender or other difference, yeah? Yeah. Why are they being made at this point in time? And that's about situating the experience of learning in history. Uh, who funds the research and who benefits from the promulgation of these findings mm -hmm. is really central. How has that affected those, those discourses, affected the student in terms of their own his self, their own uh, sense of their own abilities? So within the critical thinking tradition, this is seen to be achieved through positivistic, maybe unbiased modes of reasoning and inquiry. 
by contrast, critical pedagogy is not really interested in this bias or non-bias. It's about um, the, the person situated within that kind of production of knowledge and the assimilation of knowledge. Okay. And hence, if one were to design a session, say, on IQ, as well as looking at the science, it's imperative that students are also exposed to historical and political context, yeah. uh, as well as the opportunity for them to reflect personally on grading systems, on marking systems, and how it's affected their own sense of their own self, their self-esteem. Okay. And this is really where we're going with critical pedagogy. So here then the key kind of word, the key kind of a thing would be not to be totally reliant on text or words itself, but to deploy a, a wider canvas, visual, mm -hmm. auditory, tactile. Because if we're trying to enable students to get access to their self, then you cannot just use words because words themselves could, re it could, could be mechanisms for dominance, yeah? Okay. You've got to allow them to use all kinds of creative ways of uh, to accessing self. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And of course, the university like University Arts is, you know, well kind of disposed to be able to use all those different mechanisms, you know, multiple intelligences, if you want. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Gunnar. Thanks. Thank you very much.